I received dozens of death threats and obscene phone calls. Thousands of leaflets were anonymously circulated throughout the constituency, giving my home number and address. I had to live in the last days of the by-election in a flat that was completely boarded up. The Bermondsey by-election was the most wretched, deplorable, disgraceful by-election in which I've ever taken part. I've never known a by-election in which the candidate was treated in such a deplorable way by his opponent. Roy Hattersley should know, as a senior figure in a tormented party, he campaigned in many gruesome by-elections in the 1980s. But there was nothing like Bermondsey, the contest that Peter Tatchell fought and lost in 1983. From the very beginning, there was a whiff of dark decay about the whole affair. The sitting MP, Bob Mellish, triggered the by-election in what was a safe Labour seat three months after resigning from the party. Mellish had been a prominent figure when Labour was last in power, an authoritarian chief whip at a time when his government had no majority in the Commons. Increasingly at odds with his own left-wing activists, Mellish announced his resignation from the party, and when questioned by an interviewer, he appeared to be in despair. How do you feel about having to leave it under these circumstances I'm now? I'm sad and sorry and sick, and thoroughly, thoroughly ashamed. Of the party? Of everything. Absolutely sick of, sick of everything. And I feel very sad. Mellish might have felt sick and sad, but his local party in Bermondsey was delighted. Many of the activists didn't like Mellish's style or agree with what they saw as his outdated reactionary political outlook. But the leader of the Labour Party, Michael Foote, was deeply uneasy. The party members in Bermondsey had selected Tatchell, a young left-winger, as their candidate. But this was a general election year, and even the left-wing Foote was wary of Tatchell. In a moment of great drama, Foote disowned Tatchell's candidacy in the House of Commons during Prime Minister's question time. The individual concerned is not an endorsed member of the Labour Party, and as so far as I'm concerned, never will be an endorsed member. No one had expected this. Foote was in effect not only disowning Tatchell, but the constituency party, a highly charged confrontation with wider implications. Tatchell, who had assumed that the candidacy was in the bag, could hardly believe the news. One moment he had been an aspirant MP, largely unknown. The next he was famous, but in danger of not even being a candidate. I was at work when I received a telephone call from a journalist informing me that Michael Foote had said in Parliament that I would never be a Labour candidate. And it was a moment of utter disbelief. I kept on saying to him, are you sure he's talking about me? But he was, and very soon more journalists were phoning. It, it took me completely by shock and surprise. Tony Benn was one of those immediately aware of the wider implications. In his deputy leadership campaign 18 months earlier, he had made much of the need for local parties to have more power over the national leadership. In this, the leadership was asserting itself in the most sensitive area of the lot, the right of a local constituency to choose their own candidate, and in this case, with fatal consequences for the candidate. Peter Tashel suffered immensely because of the leadership let him down, not just let him down, but denounced him for the day he was selected. I mean, I, I can think of no parallel in, in history of the Labour Party with that having happened, and although, and Michael Foote did in the end support his candidature, the damage was done. And that was the point. In the end, Foote gave in and allowed Tatchell to be Labour's candidate. His rather unfortunate implicit message to the voters of Bermondsey was that although he himself had originally rejected Tatchell's candidacy, they should now elect him as their MP. But this unhelpful context was almost the least of Tatchell's problems. The newspapers went for him. Sensing blood, the Liberals went for him. The allies of Bob Mellish, who were supporting an independent Labour candidate, went for him as well. But here was the tantalising situation for Tatchell. He was being bashed around, literally and metaphorically, but it was a safe Labour seat. He must have thought that, in spite of it all, he was on course to become a Labour MP for life. Initially, I tried to counter and rebut a lot of the untruths, but I soon realised it was pointless. I instead threw myself into very intense campaigning within the constituency, and in the run-up to the by-election, I personally knocked on the doors and met 23,000 electors. That's half of the entire electorate in the constituency. But at the end of the day, it proved insufficient to overcome the sheer weight of the final assault in the final weeks by those uh, tabloid and right-wing newspapers. 
And it wasn't just the newspapers, was it? At a local level, the campaign was pretty nasty. I mean, you received death threats. There was a leaflet saying, which queen will you vote for? With the implication, clearly, that you were a gay candidate or you hadn't come out. What was your reaction to that? It was very, very, very hateful. All around the constituency, on every wall, bus shelter and hoarding, there were slogans in two or three foot high letters, Tatchell is a communist proof. Tatchell is a nigger lover. Tatchell is queer. And how did you personally cope with this? I had some night terrors because during the course of going around knocking on doors and canvassing in the constituency, I was physically attacked over 150 times in a 15-month period. And of course, that does have its toll, but psychologically and emotionally, I just wouldn't let it grind me down. I just was doggedly determined to carry on, to give up my best and hopefully win. The campaign was indeed bleaker and more sordid than its origins. The independent Labour candidate John O'Grady alluded to Tatchell's homosexuality at a time when Tatchell himself had made no public comment on whether he was gay. O'Grady, with Mellish beside him on a horse and cart, left voters in little doubt. I'll give you a song about Tatchell. Tatchell is a puppet, as pretty as can be. But he must be slow if he don't know he can't be our MP. But there may be a bizarre twist to the taunting of Tatchell by O'Grady. John O'Grady's homophobic ditty was deeply ironic because sitting next to him on that horse and cart and supporting his candidature was Bob Mellish, the former Labour Member of Parliament for Bermondsey, who was himself secretly bisexual. I think it just reinforces the incredible homophobia and hypocrisy both of that campaign and of the way it was reported by the media. In retrospect, the by-election seems even more dark and decadent than it did at the time. In an old Labour constituency, Mellish attempted to put off traditional Labour voters by alluding to Tatchell's homosexuality. Tatchell himself did not come out publicly. As for Mellish's apparent double standards, Tatchell claims to have personal experience. It's what we would call sexual harassment. I, I just looked at it, well, you know, he's rather persistent. I was always very charming with him and just sort of polite, firm no. But a lot of people nowadays would say I should have bought a sexual harassment suit. But he actually said to me, I wouldn't advise you to repeat this to anyone. No one will believe you. I'm a married man with four children. You, you'll only make yourself an object of ridicule. But what of Tatchell himself, given his subsequent prominence in relation to gay rights? Why did he keep his own sexuality quiet during that campaign? My one big regret about the Bermondsey by-election campaign was that I wasn't totally open about my sexuality. Yes, I was on the doorstep and it got me a few punches in the face, but I should have also been open in press conferences as well. But in the circumstances, in a much more homophobic climate, it was much more difficult. And even people on the left of the Labour Party generally had advised me not to come out. So I felt very isolated and if I had come out, it would have been a very, very lonely road. The ineptitude of the Labour leadership, the vicious newspaper reporting, the homophobia in Bermondsey and Tatchell's controversial left-wing views all combined to produce one of Labour's most disastrous by-election results in recent history, the loss of the seat to the Liberals. I therefore declare that Simon Henry Ward Hughes has been duly elected to serve as Member of Parliament for the Southwark Bermondsey constituency. Imagine how Tatchell felt on that night. All the anguish of the campaign, the intense battle to remain Labour's candidate, and nothing to show for it at the end beyond a humiliating defeat. But he claims the defeat set his life on a different and more positive course. My reaction was not to crawl away and hide. I felt we've seen in this campaign what even to me was an absolutely shocking level of vicious violent homophobia. I want to sort of turn things around and use my name that is now in the public domain as a way of projecting these issues so that perhaps we can create a situation where future election candidates don't have to go through what I went through. So as you said, there is a direct link between that by-election campaign and what you went on to do? There is a direct link between my experience of that unprecedented violent homophobia and my subsequent work for gay and lesbian human rights. And you moved on to a flamboyant style of campaigning, targeting national figures who he considered to be intolerant of gay issues. However prominent the figure, Tatchell wasn't remotely deterred. One of his targets was the then Archbishop of Canterbury. For eight years, I tried to have a meeting with the Archbishop of Canterbury. 
there came a point when I thought, we can't let this man get away with publicly advocating discrimination against fellow human beings who happen to be gay. On Easter Sunday, 1998, Tatchell targeted the Archbishop's sermon. Luke tells us they remember... Dr. Carey supports discrimination against lesbian and gay people. He opposes lesbian and gay human rights. This is not a Christian teaching. I've got no regrets about that brief peaceful protest because it got results. Within three months, he met for the first time with members of the lesbian and gay Christian movement. Within a month, the bishops of the Church of England issued one of their strongest ever condemnations of homophobic discrimination. More controversially, Tatchell launched a campaign to out some prominent gays. Even some of his closest political allies opposed this particular campaign, one that had several privately gay MPs in a state of near terror. Did it never trouble him that he was outing people when he hadn't been fully open about his own sexuality during the by-election? Well, the outing campaign was never about exposing people because they were gay. We had never said that people should come out and if they don't, we'll out them. What we did say is that if people are anti-gay in public but gay in private, then that is an issue of hypocrisy. It's very instructive the way in which so many people have a problem with outing hypocrites and homophobes who happen to be gay, when they don't have any problem about exposing family values MPs who cheat on their wives. Tatchell's outing tactics attracted widespread criticism, but some of his high-profile campaigns have been widely praised, none more so than his attempted arrest of President Mugabe. And put you under arrest on charges of torture under the United Nations Convention Against Torture. In a dramatic scuffle, a bemused Mugabe looked on as Tatchell was knocked unconscious by Mugabe's bodyguards in front of the world's media. When I came to, President Mugabe and his entourage were gone. I had a very sore head, but felt, well, at least I've exposed this bastard. In that painful moment, Tatchell's world had come full circle. The newspapers that had taunted him mercilessly in the by-election many years previously sang his praises. His courage and principles were hailed in the mail and the telegraph. Some admirers described him as a Christ figure, crusading from his flat in Bermondsey. He doesn't earn much money. The by-election has made him wary and nervous of the media. The attacks on him and his flat that began during the by-election have continued ever since. But on one level at least, the traumas of the Bermondsey by-election were the making of him. In some ways, I'm rather glad I wasn't elected as an MP. I fear that I may have ended up as a rather ineffectual, anonymous backbencher. I may have become seduced by new labour. Some of my friends tell me I would have been a cabinet minister by now. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> But I sort of suspect that from the outside, I have made some contribution towards putting lots of human rights issues on the agenda in a way that perhaps wouldn't have been possible if I'd just been merely tabling parliamentary questions. Although he denies it now, the Bermondsey defeat must have been a blow of sorts for Tatchell. For a short period, at least, a parliamentary career beckoned at a time when parts of the Labour Party were moving leftwards, closer to his thinking. But given the controversy surrounding his candidacy, it's unlikely he'd have been made especially welcome at Westminster. And as far as Thatcher was concerned, the revisionist years of Kinnock, Smith and Blair were soon to follow. By losing, Thatcher gained the freedom to campaign in any way he chose. And here's the final irony of all. Foote originally vetoed Thatcher's candidacy because of an article in which Thatcher had advocated extra-parliamentary action. Yet, it's some of his extra-parliamentary actions that have subsequently won the praise of the Mail and the Telegraph. For Tatchell, Bermondsey was a brutal but lucky defeat.